uh, for you to um, well, participate in this interview on behalf of Executive People and CIONA. And uh, welcome. I'd like to spend a couple of uh, minutes of your time to discuss your view on IT in general, talk about your former role, talk about your current role at Salesforce. Yes, okay. Thank you very much yeah. for having me. Okay. Uh, reading up a little bit on your uh, background, your statements, I read a statement, uh, money doesn't matter, but ideas do. So I want to start off, what's inspired you? Where do you get your ideas from? Well, I mean, if you look at um, my, my path in life, yeah. um, you know, I've had a, a unique path and um, a very unlikely journey uh, to the White House itself. And part of it is because I grew up in uh, Tanzania and um, I had the opportunity to see how tough life can be uh, and how you have to get by and very little. I still remember coming to the United States in the very, very early days and uh, I was just blown away uh, by the, a land where you had so much prosperity uh, and so much in terms of resources. So part of what's inspired me is when I look at uh, this sort of massive divide, you know, whether you look at it domestically or internationally, is recognizing that uh, there always is an innovative path and some of the most wicked problems the world faces uh, can be solved through great ideas, um, through actually finding those innovative ideas. You know, whether you look at uh, the healthcare space and uh, breakthrough vaccines that have been discovered, or whether you look at uh, you know public safety and you look at what modern computing has allowed us to do with big data and analytics um, to solve crime and keep crime down, or whether you look at education and asking some of the tougher questions around why can't the best uh, classroom be as compelling as the best video game on the planet and how do you engineer um, an education experience like that. Uh, so those are the types of things that really inspire me to solve really difficult problems that uh, have uh, meaning in terms of improving the state of the world. Okay. Um, now you were the first federal CIO in the States, if I'm correct. Yes, so yeah. President Obama, yeah. when yeah. Uh, he came to the White House, one of the first things he did um, is he created the role of the CIO, uh, and a big part of that was to make sure that the United States could compete globally when it comes to information technology, okay. but also in terms of government operations. Okay. Why did he choose you? Well, my path, um, actually, in terms of public service, was very much around, uh, you know, before the White House, I had worked in local government at the county level, at the state level, and at the city level in the city of Washington, D.C. And so I had this perspective, um, which was very, very much tied to the citizen. And um, I had driven a lot of initiatives at the local level around uh, moving towards government operations that were open, that were transparent, that were participatory, instead of the old government model, which was closed, mm -hmm. secret, and opaque, uh, saving millions of dollars through adopting game-changing technologies, mm -hmm. and also making sure that all those decisions around high-tech were made by putting the citizen at the heart of government operations. Okay. But I would assume that you had some kind of competition from other CIOs. So a lot of competition. Yeah, I a lot of competition. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but as far as you're seeing, it's just a, a scaling up the local regional uh, experience on a uh, federal. Right, but it was also consistent with the values the president had, yeah. uh, which was around making sure that uh, we had an open, transparent, uh, participatory government around saving money um, and cracking down on wasteful technology spending across the public sector. Because yeah, I noticed that you, uh, you drive a lot of things, uh, getting people to the cloud, uh, apps for democ democracy, open source. Um, you've pushed that quite a lot when you were in uh, public service. Absolutely. Yeah. And a big part of that is, uh, I think, the old model of government, uh, unfortunately, treated uh, citizens uh, with this big government that uh, was managing subjects, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the new model of governance is about citizens being co-creators. Uh, co and that was a central part of uh, a lot of what I did uh, as a chief technology officer and the chief information officer in Washington, 
was very much around figuring out, well, how do we use um, technology, the platforms, to engage the American people, to make sure that they're helping solve in the community some of these tougher problems. The government does not have a monopoly on the best thinking or the best ideas. Just because you're a government official doesn't mean you have all the answers. Okay. And it's that humility to be able to say, look, let's go out and engage the public to whether it's build applications um, around government services or take government data that we would democratize and build the next billion dollar companies or hold government officials accountable for their actions uh, through greater transparency. Okay. What's the, what was the reaction of the incumbents, the big IT vendors in the States? Because you're asking the, uh, the public to participate, co-create. Well, Did they raise their hand, hey, I want to be part of this? Well, so what, what happens um, over time is uh, that if you look at government technology, and one of the reasons I think you have a huge gap in innovation between the consumer world, um, where you have Darwinian pressure for innovation and government IT, is because, frankly, a lot of the people that end up winning government contracts, it's not because they're innovative, it's not because they have game-changing technologies, it's because they have a PhD in how the procurement process works. And that is problematic because what it does is it, it locks out innovation. That's quite so, a cynical view on this. Uh, but it is a reality. Yeah. If you look at uh, you know countries around the world and you look at uh, a history, decades of yeah. failed IT projects. Okay. But does that mean that you want to leave out those big firms and go with the small SMEs, the startups, and the public? What you want to yeah. do is yeah. you want to create a race to the top. Yeah. If there's somebody who can solve the problem, you know, for hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions instead of taking a billion dollars on an IT project or do it in weeks and months instead of years, why not? Because at the end of the day, as a government official, you're acting in the interest of taxpayers, of your citizenry. Uh, instead of wasting money, why not find the innovative path? Okay, so what I hear you, you facilitated creating a level playing field. So everybody and more competition. competition. More competition. Okay, so what's your best example you're most proud of, what you've achieved in that period? Well, so if we look at uh, the time we were in, uh, in, the, in the White House, we went after a lot of this wasteful spending, and what was really interesting is we launched this IT dashboard uh, where we took every single IT project and took the picture of every CIO in the United States government, put their picture next to the projects that they're responsible for, and made that data and information public. And within the first six months, we were able to save over $3 billion by going after wasteful spending. The second thing we ended up doing as a result of that is uh, we changed the law uh, in the America Competes Act, where we allowed agencies to issue competitions, prizes, um, to actually find more innovative solutions. From the Department of Labor to the Department of Education to NASA, we started seeing this massive movement to where agencies were using challenges and prizes uh, to actually deploy technology instead of the old model of uh, multi-million dollar procurements that would take years and years to deploy. Okay, now you mentioned IT dashboard, you put up the picture of the CIO, what was, the react what was their initial reaction? Did they like that? So I think I became public enemy yeah. number one yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> they were not happy, yeah. you know, obviously initially. Yeah. And what was really interesting is we also showed it to President Obama. And uh, I took that picture of the president, you know, uh, looking at the dashboard and shared it with all the CIOs. Um, and what was really interesting about that is some of them called me and said, you won't believe what happened. My cabinet secretary called me to the office to explain why these projects were behind schedule and I've been in government for eight yeah. years and I've never been called yeah. before. And so I think there was this kind of pressure um, that created equality. Um, and you know, as Justice Brandeis said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Okay. Because we were shining a bright yeah. light on government operations, you could actually see uh, in daylight what was working, what wasn't working, who was responsible. So you moved away from this culture of faceless accountability to where individuals were now accountable for projects that they were managing. Okay, but the way you describe it now, that means that, that it sounds like you've created the wall of shame initially. 
Well, I think that it's not, I don't see it at all as a wall of shame, and here's why. Well, why public enemy number one? Well, because I think that was the natural yeah. instinct. Yeah. So when a yeah. government is hardwired yeah. to be closed, secretive, and opaque, anything where you shine a bright light, the default assumption is it's bad. My view on it is absolutely not. Just because something is red and it's behind schedule, we need to decide what is in the interest of the citizens. Do we kill this project? Do we descope it? Do we throw more money after this? Is that throwing good money after bad money or not? It forced a set of conversations that were pointed, that were after the truth, that were tough, but it led to better outcomes, right? In many cases, the CIOs were the ones saying, I've been raising my hand, screaming for help. Nobody's helping me. But now, because it was all in the open, in the daylight, uh, accountability could not be escaped. Okay, so it can turn into a cool wall where people get recognized for work well done as well. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Um, can you share me a secret? How, well, how IT savvy is Obama? Oh, he's very, you know, technology savvy. If you look at what he did, by the way, on uh, the campaign before yeah. he even came to the White House, um, he made a decision to invest heavily on the technology side. And if you look at, um, you know, what he did in 2008 and 2012, um, laid the foundation for what modern campaigns look like in terms of making sure that you're using big data, making sure that you're being responsive to the citizenry, and then coming into office, you know, he's the one that actually created the role uh, of the CIO with a huge emphasis on uh, information technology. If I read up on you, you are called uh, a rock star CIO. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so being the, the federal CIO puts you in that position, people. Uh, you seem to be a wrong role model on a global level. How does it feel? Does that pressurize you or not? Well, I don't see it that way, right? What, what I see it as is um, simply doing a couple of things, right? Number one is making sure you know who you work for, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think, unfortunately, for too many people, they forget. You know, at the end of the day, we're public servants. So by putting your citizens at the heart of every decision you make, it actually becomes an easy choice every morning, every afternoon, every evening because you're focused singularly on figuring out, well, how do I solve these problems? Okay. And number two, I think it's you know recognizing that uh, when you look at the future of technology, it's very, very important to make sure that uh, the government itself is investing in the future um, and has a much longer point of view than, um, frankly, a lot of other organizations because countries are not like companies, right? Uh, as a former CIO, what are your lessons learned you would want to pass on to any new CIO in that role? What does he or she need to know, need to uh, focus on? So the number one thing I would say is uh, the ability to approach um, problems with a mind of a baby. And what I mean by that is for too many technology leaders, you know, they're too stuck in uh, history um, and that is one of the reasons I think you see whether it's multinational corporations or governments or NGOs, they're still operating in a world of mainframes and mini computers uh, is because they don't approach problems with the beginner's mind or they're thinking about um, these challenges and saying, what is the future? How do I make sure that I'm engineering my organization so it's consistent with what my customers need? Number two, I would say begin with the customer in mind. Engineer everything around the customer. It was so surprising to me on a number of technology initiatives that I saw where you would see tech driving um, instead of uh, being a tool for business or being a tool for government. So the second thing I would say is make sure you know who you work for, who the customer is. Uh, because that will fundamentally change the way you approach problems. And then again, yeah, but then again, nobody needed an iPad before we had an iPad. Well, so no, there but there has to be some kind of technology. Oh no, absolutely. Down. I think, uh, but but I think in the context of the business side, like unless you're yeah, building a technology yeah. company, mm -hmm. how you employ that technology is what I'm talking about. Yeah. But but the third, you know, a big thing I would say is. Uh, 
you should even think of having a zero print technology organization, right? Uh, why is it that you need all of these IT assets? Your, every single industry you look at is in the midst of being disrupted, whether you're in healthcare, in retail, or you're in communications or the auto industry. I mean, think about uh, a company like the Gilt Group uh, versus a company like Sears. It took 50 years for a company like Sears to get to 500 million. It took Gilt Group three years to do the same thing. And what I mean by that is the technology has become a very powerful weapon to disrupt that entire industry. And so you've got to be able to approach these problems very differently than uh, what your peer groups have done. To your point earlier, yeah. just because they were doing it a certain way, it doesn't mean it's going to work um, against the competition you're facing now. Okay, so the three takeaways, be inquisitive, that's one. Always have the customer in mind. And three, I would summarize it up as be congruent. Practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. Eat your own dog food. And disrupt. Thank you.